Hey there, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Thank you all so much for stopping by my channel here, The Magical Solution, on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We are back. We've been on a sabbatical for quite some time, about two months now. Lots of changes going on with The Magical Solution, good changes that I'm really excited to share with you guys in the near future. But we're back, and we are kicking off our interview season with a dear friend of mine and a newly published author. Her name is Leah Russ. She was born in the high Rocky Mountains of Colorado in a town so small that only three other children were born that year. Perhaps because of the sparseness of human population and the vastness of the natural world, Leah learned to open her senses to connect with the energies of everything around her. It wasn't until she moved to Westchester County, New York, at the age of nine, that she began to realize she was different from the other children. Between her sensitivities to the energies and a discovery that she was dyslexic, Leah feared that she would never fit in. She grew to dislike her differences, and because there were no supports, she began to feel like she was irrevocably stupid and despaired about what life would be like for her as an adult. This sense of despair followed her and overshadowed her life until that very discomfort caused her to leave the USA far, far east at 19 in search of answers. She was devout, devoted. She devoted her life to understanding the things that she saw and felt all around her and that no one else seemed to be aware of and to finding information that would save others from having to experience the pain of isolation and self-doubt that she had went through. Leah loves nature, animals, solving mysteries, writing, creating art, and of course, dancing. She has traveled extensively in the United States and Asia and currently lives in upstate New York with her boyfriend, two dogs, two cats, two carrots, and many plants. Leah collects strays, crystals, and of course, the dots. Her new book called Connecting the Dots is an absolute phenomenon. It just got published Tuesday the 16th, and I'm so excited to be her first interview on this book because you guys are going to be the first to know about this amazing book from her mouth. I'm not going to speak anymore. Let's just bring her in. Let's do this. Hey. Hey, girl. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? It's been so long. It's been so long. How yeah, are you? Good. I'm doing great. And I miss <laughs> your singing. I know. So Leah used to come to all of my shows back in the day when I had my band. And we broke up not too long ago. And man, we were both bummed about that one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I hope you get to do it again. I hope so too. I got to find a band. But enough about me, girl. Okay. Girl, you wrote a book, okay? Which, by the way, yeah. you had kind of let me be privy to uh, years ago when we first met. And when you told me that you were going to be writing this book and you started giving me little snippets about what this book was going to be about, I was like at the edge of my, like, I couldn't wait for you to be done. I remember like asking, so is it, is it ready yet? Like, are you done yet? Like, what's going on? So, yeah, let's talk about this. Connecting the dots. So why why this book? Why now? Well, I didn't really have a lot of choice, to be honest with you. So I had been asked in 2014 to give a lecture at the American Dowsing Society on a theory I came up with in my early 20s on vibrational frequency crystals, crystal healing, and crystal awareness. And because this was 2014 and my early 20s was a few decades before that, I knew I needed to really study up. So in studying for this lecture, which went over beautifully, I got pregnant. You got with pregnant. the book. <laughs> with the book. <laughs> and just like when you're pregnant and the baby's kicking inside of you, all of a sudden, how I knew I was pregnant was this book was kicking inside of me at night. Mm. 
and it wouldn't let me sleep. Mm. So um, I had been, before I left for this, I had almost finished my first book, which is a memoir called Winging It, about my journey at 19 with $500 and a round trip ticket to Asia for two and a half years at my search for answers. But this book was born of the scientific information that I was receiving in all my researching. And there were so many things that were blowing my mind. I mean, completely. And what I started realizing is the things science was proving was echoing things that our ancestors knew and practices that they had. I mean, it goes back even to the ancient Norse. They had a mythology about the creation of the universe that had to do with the universe crystallizing out of these two elements. One was kind of the land of the North and I can't pronounce it. And the other was the land of the South, which I also can't pronounce. <laughs> and they came together in chaos and injected parts of themselves. I mean, elemental sex, anybody? You know, they, and from this, the universe crystallized. That's their, out of chaos. They did this in chaos, isn't that cool? But so the truth of the matter is we've only just begun to realize that the universe is crystalline in nature. And we have a ton of crystal in our bodies. And crystals are elastic. Isn't that crazy? And Wait metals are a crystalline substance. And all crystalline substances conduct energy more readily than any other material. And we can talk about that now. Yeah, I mean, it is. It. Well, I will say, you know, the the crystal chapter specifically of your book is phenomenal. And I do want to get there. But I have to ask. I mean, we're talking about 77 freaking chapters, lady. 77. Your book is not small. <laughs> okay? That bitch is not small. And it's got, no. it's, it's got a lot. It's got a lot of juicy meat. You, you've, got, you've got the scientific stuff. You've got the psychological stuff. You've got the metaphysical stuff, the philosophy stuff. It's all in there. The spiritual stuff. It's all intertwined in there. So of 77 chapters... What's the purpose of this book? I mean, and I mean, these chapters are so like the titles of them are so all over the place. Now, mind you guys, those of you who are watching, I still haven't gotten my copy yet, and so I haven't read the totality of it. I read a few chapters, um, by the graciousness of Leah, was able to send me some of the snippets, and but the but the the index for it, the 70s, I was like, wow, these titles are all over, like, they're you've got a subject on absolutely everything. So why, why all of these stuff? Like, what do they all have to do with each other? What's the point of the book? Well, isn't life a little bit complex? <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's, <laughs> how do you make so, it make sense? What, how are we making it make sense? Well, this is the whole point is that in, I really wanted to reveal to people a broad spectrum of reality, of truth. And in order to do that, I kind of had to look at all these different little wedges and then show you the correlation between them, how they seem like they're completely separate from each other. But, you know, here they're exactly the same as here, here, and here. And here, you know, you can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> And this, I'm dyslexic, and in this particular, this doesn't happen on Zoom, but this like reverses itself. It makes me nuts because I can't figure out which hand I'm moving and how to move it up or down or, oh my God. <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, so these different slices, they relate to each other in different places. And in order for you to fully, fully accept a lot of this stuff, you kind of, I think, need to be shown it here. Right, I gotta move my hand this way, here, here, you know, in the spectrum of it, if that makes any sense, you know? So it's like, of course, there's a chapter on our brains. Of course, there's a chapter on epigenetics, which is this really cool new science 
where they've determined that trauma that has been um, experienced by our ancestors not only is translated into our cellular memory where we experience anxiety from the same trauma that they suffered even if we never experienced it before if that same type of trauma happens we experience their cellular memories of it and so we experience more fear but those experiences change us physiologically they actually change our genetic makeup and make us more sensitive to them because the whole point of the system our whole biological system is to give us early warning systems and an early warning system would be your ancestor passing down this thing saying hey don't walk down that road hello Psst, tap you on the shoulder Right. So you feel the anxiety and then you're more sensitive to it because right. like in the case of these mice that were experimented on, they shocked the foot of the male mouse every time they injected a smell into his environment. And it didn't take him long before he was traumatized by that smell, even without shocks. Then they took his sperm and spread it in all these different labs. And each like descendant from that mouse not only experienced fear when it smelled that smell or, or exhibited agitation, mm -hmm. but the receptors in their nose for that smell were like three times larger than in regular mm. mice. So that's how much these things can affect us. And if you're starting to look at how people control other people, this is also something we need to think about. Yes. You know, you made it clear that like your book definitely looks at the macrocosm. Yep. And then also, and it, it, and it brings it all the way down. It funnels it down to our microcosm to our cells, to our body, how our body reacts to that. In addition to, of course, the social aspect of it, you know, so, you know, your book kind of covers it all. It covers, it covers the big macro of this idea of paradigm and creation and the big, the big thoughts. It brings it then down to the social stuff, you know, what we, what we deal with with governments and civil, civil, you know, interactions. And then it brings it down to the body. And then it brings it down to the inner parts of the body, the chakras, the bones, the this, the that. So you really kind of encompass all of that and how each of them affects each other, both from the outward going in and from the inward going out. Yep. So I kind of want to touch a little bit on all of that. Like, you know, you know, if we can, if we can squeeze it all in, because what you're really talking about here is is functioning and living life in a holistic way, not holistic as in the H-O, but holistic with the W, understanding the whole whole. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things you spoke about, which I thought was really, really just on point, was this idea that your body has gifts to be able to sense this, world that's around us and and of yep. course the internal world and the spiritual world as well and these gifts i think I, I would love to kind of pick your brain on these on these various gifts where they're located in the body how to access them and and, and what you talked about in your book yeah well just to lead into that what you were saying about this holistic you know that's a word that's been used a lot and sometimes i can feel jaded to it like oh, why is it really that important but in this case that wholeness so the word remember literally means to reattach like these are your members, right? So you're, it's like you're reattaching all these parts of yourself. And it's so vital to do that because we have been systematically disenfranchised from these parts of ourselves that if we were paying attention would change our lives radically for the good. We would 
know whether we were in the right place at the right time. We would know if we were hanging out with the right people. We wouldn't vacillate in our decisions. And think about if you knew and you were working in unison with your body, who is your friend. And this whole information, even thinking about that, has been taken away from us. We come to think of the body as this dumb animal, which is how we've come to think of animals, which is why I get into all these recent findings in animal biology and even psychology, I would call it, but you know, their brains and how their brains function. So getting back to us, one of our gifts is our gut. And, you know, when people say, trust your gut, some people live by that, but I don't know if any of us have really looked at what that means. So your gut has five times as many neurons in it as your peripheral nervous system and your spinal column combined, okay? The main function of a neuron is to transmit information. But buried deep inside your gut, what information could that part of your body with no access to eyes or ears or hands for touching, what information could it be receiving to need to transmit? Right. So then I start looking at, well, let's look at some of the qualities of the gut to see if we can find some answers. And I like to do this over and over again. When there's a mystery, I look at how things really are to try and discern the answers. Okay. So the first thing you know about the gut is that, I mean, aside from its function that scientists are aware of, is that the material that these neurons are embedded in is the first material, well, the only material used for 2000 years to carry vibrational frequency without altering its frequency in um, musical instrument strings. So the strings were made of gut because they carry an accurate frequency. Wow. Then if you look at the placement of the gut, we have a single strand of gut where we have bone. Now, not only is bone dense, which would alter frequency, but it's crystalline in nature and crystals do their own thing with frequency. So we'll talk about that in another chapter. But you, when you look at the rest of the gut, we have it resting in a hollow space, right? If you look at the side view of a person, they have, uh, I got to move back, forward, whatever. I can't figure this out. Anyway, you've got this hollow space here with a skin stretched tight over the front of it, just mm. like a drum. And, you know, drums hold and resonate frequency. They're kind of like pressure cookers for frequency, if you think about it. But yeah. so... We've got all these neurons in our gut. And I believe the only reason could be is to pick up every single vibrational frequency that you are around and mm. particularly in front of you, because that's where it's all open. Wow. And then there's more. It's like we've got these ganglia in there, which are cluster, clusters of neurons that resemble brains in many ways. Um, some of them have to do with, they have something similar to the blood brain barrier. They have these um, star, uh, star shaped cells called astroglia that help in the brain with reorganizing it mm -hmm. and a couple of other things, but we've got the majority of those ganglia sitting in our solar plexus. Now, it's so interesting that there's a chakra for the solar plexus, but yeah. the solar plexus is where the seat of our will is, okay? So we've got all of this extra ability to read frequency in this center. And if you think about it, like when someone says, I've got that pink, that sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, 
that's right at your solar plexus, mm. you know, or when you have butterflies. These are all ways that your body is communicating to you, but we have conveniently been taught to completely ignore that there is communication from the body besides hunger or needing to go to the bathroom or sex, right? That's pretty much. Yeah. yeah you know, you know, is we've been functioning from the level that our body is a machine yep. and it simply just needs to be fed and given its basic needs in order to function. And that's it. You know, it doesn't yep. do anything more than that. And even that is not even done well. You know, the food that we are being given is food pumped with hormones and sugar and, you know, salt. Um, the water is poison. Yeah. The air is poison. Yeah. You know, so it's just like even even the act of telling us to take care of this machine, they're they're doing it with the like the the crappiest of materials to do that with. Yeah. And, you know, one of my chapters is called the seven generation principle. And I bring that up because for the Haudenosaunee, which are the Iroquois nation, the Iroquois confederacy, it was actually by the time it was sort of disbanded, although it was never fully, but when the natives in this country really lost any ability to do anything for a long time, there were six different niches within that, but one of the laws, there's a great law of peace. And one of the laws in it is that for a ruler, a chief, that they, um, that no law could be put in place where the effects of it were not considered for seven generations. Now, the interesting thing is, is that most of our constitution came from the great law of peace. Actually, Benjamin Franklin and Johnson were huge fans of the Iroquois. They were incredible orators. They had the oldest practicing fully democ democratic system. It's 900 years old. Wow. So anyway, but that... Can you imagine if our rulers, if in every single country, the people in charge thought about what the effects for seven generations, we wouldn't have polluted water. We wouldn't have polluted food. We would have good school systems for our children and we would be taught appropriate things. Right. We're not taught appropriate things. We don't even know how to deal with our human emotions like there is no bad emotion none even anger don't you understand everything we were given we were created with is there for a good reason if we think it isn't it's because we've gone astray our thinking's gone astray and why is that because divide and conquer if i divide you from yourself I've conquered you a little bit. If I divide you from your neighbor, I've conquered you a little bit. If I divide you from nature, which you are inseparable from, I've conquered you. Even the concepts of, even the concepts of labeling things is a form of divide. Because we, we, you know, we, we don't see it that way because as a society, it's important to label things. It's important to give things its categories that you can address them in whatever need you need to address them in. But, but even the idea of labeling, it can divide us. Like, for example, you know, what you're speaking about is conscious creation, intentional creation, that, that all of us are essentially perfect as we are, you know, and that our bodies and that our and that everything about us is a gift that can be used to sense the world and engage in the world. Yes. Ideally, right? And where the issue can come in is these, these issues of labels and these issues of, well, this person is broken and this person has a mental illness or this person is missing a limb and this person is born in a country where they don't get access to food and clean water and they're starving. So where is where is the conscious and intentional creation in that where is their purpose how are how are they perfect as they are you know you get these automatic rebuttals because 
we are focusing on the labels of imperfection versus looking at it for what it is. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I saw someone um, on YouTube who got into a horrible accident and lost like all of his limbs, except I think one, one foot or one leg. And the man does everything, you know, feeds himself with that foot, plays pianos with that foot, does everything with that foot and has a very acute ability to understand spatial awareness, despite not having his other limbs, which is something that people with limbs have an acuteness to. And so like, there's like, it was almost like he overcompensated in that area because he didn't have that thing. And that's just one example that I just saw. And of course, that's not everyone's story, but I just find it interesting how the body compensates even when there is loss and how, again, even when you think it's not perfect, it's perfect. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, there, there's so many different interesting avenues that you can kind of go down and look at. And I really think it's important to really look at them all and weigh them out and use, okay, again, we're each created completely uniquely. The lens through which we view everything is completely unique to us. Nobody else sees every situation the same way we perceive it. It's just Even identical not. twins. It's never, it will never exactly. be. Exactly. Because again, since none of us is created by mistake or things are not random in terms of whether we were created this way or, or it's evolution, right? Either way you look at it, there's a wisdom behind it. I feel when I look at things. So if that's the case, then there has to be tremendous value in us each being unique. Tremendous value. And that means how you perceive things is important. Okay. But so one of the, th the paths I've walked in terms of understanding is this concept that is really supported by the uh, first law of thermodynamics, which is the energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And if you look at something as simple as what are your thoughts, your thoughts are electrical impulses jumping between synapse to synapse, right? Just jumping. That's your thought. So your thought is electrical in nature. It's energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So what happened to you before you were born? Where were you? You weren't not, you didn't not exist. And that means when you die, that energy will also go someplace. Now, just because we're calling it energy, maybe this is soul. Maybe this is what the Bible talks about. You know, it says you're a mortal soul. Well, if energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it sounds immortal, doesn't it? So it's semantics, it's labels, just what you were talking about, what you call it. It, 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 take dark matter and dark energy, for instance, okay? It, they can't be seen. There's not really, you know, an instrument that can, can view them, not a microscope, not, you know, but how would they were discovered by was by facts. And that is if the universe was created from a big bang, right? When it first explodes, it's going to have a lot of force. It's going to be moving faster and faster, but soon it'll slow down because that energy that was expanding it initially is gone, the explosion. So it will eventually slow down. And it's been a millennia, right? Since the big bang. But in fact, the universe is expanding at an increasing rate. Mm. So Again, I'm jumping around here a lot, but if you look at medicine, right, I've studied with a lot of Native American tribes and I really relate to a lot of their philosophies and beliefs, but um, a medicine for them is an energy that every being has to impart to another being. And it's called medicine because it 
can heal you. It can be a strength that you need. Sometimes even seeing this medicine can help you realize what you don't want to be. But so we, we all have medicine to impart. So to find out what something's medicine is, you observe it. So what would be the medicine of what we're calling dark energy. Can you see me? Cause I've black, oh, there we go. <laughs> I blacked out and I saw a swirly thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to figure out what the medicine of dark matter and dark energy is, we look at their nature. Okay, so their nature is that they are doing this, right? They're expanding. They're also, you need to look at the fact that they make up 95, up to 95% of the energy in the entire universe. Mm -hmm. So in other words, to discover their medicine would be to discover the medicine of 95% of the energy in our universe. Mm -hmm. And even if, you know, now they're, they're saying like, well, maybe it's not dark matter. Maybe it's just the fact of the matter is whatever you want to call it. Here we are back to labels. There is a medicine in this 95% energy that is expanding no matter what you want to call it. And what that medicine undeniably is, is that if you want to be in alignment with that energy, you need to open. Mm. Expand, it's not about expand. shutting. Yeah. It's not about tightening. It's about opening. And even if you make that movement and move slowly and just imagine yourself going with it, you can feel that energy. You can feel that you're in alignment with that. And it's powerful. Yeah. I, uh, it's interesting that you say that because I just got finished watching for like the fourth time um, the Shang-Chi movie um, and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And I love I love all martial arts movies um, and being a martial artist myself when I was younger. And it's true. It's, you know, some of the art forms that we work with, especially art forms like Tai Chi and Wing Chun is is all about that. It's all about the expansion. It's about the the movement of of wide movements and this idea of flow and moving the chi naturally. Um, and it's true when you make these movements, especially when you do it intentionally with breath, kind of like yoga. Um, you feel it, it shifts you. It shifts you. It shifts your spirit. It shifts your 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 that center that may be misaligned, it realigns it. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm sure that there are people out there who have done it by accident, you know, um, who felt it for just a moment, you know, understanding what that means. And, you know, your book, again, it's, it's a book. And I, and I want to reiterate this to the audience when the title is the perfect title for this book because it talks a little bit about everything and how everything is connected, but the purpose of connecting those things for you and to help you understand your role in all of that, I think is the biggest part of this book that should not be missed. You know, like for example, you spoke about the gut and its, and its purpose for perceiving and, and, and sensing the world. You can, you can talk about the chakras in that way. You have a chapter on crystals. Now I have to ask you about the chapter on crystals because crystals is the new hot button topic. There's even a name for all of these women out here and people out here who love crystals. They're called crystal mommies. Um, okay. And there's tons of debates on whether or not crystals are really at all magical like, do they really do something or is it like a pseudo science, you know, pill, um, you know, the colors, do they even really matter? Like if crystals are natural and they're all like, they all have energy, then can't you just assign the crystal that a thing and they all can do whatever you want them to do, no matter which ones they are. Um, so I just have to ask your chapter on crystals. Do you cover that kind of stuff? Like, what is that chapter in relation to the body? What is that chapter in relation to connecting the dots for you and your, your growth and your study? 
it's that's huge and that's what i studied for four months and gave the lecture at the american dowser society on so i could do you know two-hour talk just on the crystals but you know basically there's there's several different factors that i see involved in answering your question you know the first is that even though scientific uh, equipment had gotten much more sensitive almost for the first full four months of my research science was not giving me what i knew had to be there because i I've, I've witnessed it myself you know just look at it this way i here i am this you know 21 or 22 year old girl and i'm learning about um particles and waves and i'm learning about molecular structure right and in a molecular structure way the um everything is is put together in each molecule is different for each type of material so it's different for um you know wood as it is for fabric even as it is for you know in granite it's made up of several different types of molecular structures okay crystals are the only structure in our universe that i know of that have just one type of molecular structure mm. and it's repeated over and over in the same pattern spatially three-dimensionally wow now if you think about the fact that each of these molecules vibrates at a different rate it just stands to reason when you have a bunch of the same vibrations the same molecules in one place the overall frequency from that thing is going to be stronger than something who has multiple molecular constituents you know so if you know granite's got three or four different in my book i have pictures of a single drop of water and a the single set of rings going out evenly right and that's kind of what it would look like if you had the same vibrational frequency being repeated over and over then you have where there's been like a couple of drops put in the water and you can see where the rings start to fight with each other be and they'll cancel each other out. Occasionally they can cause a harmonic situation that can make it more powerful. And that's something that like destroyed a bridge that they named Galloping Gertie which you need to look that up because it's really powerful to watch the wind was playing through her strings and caused her to start undulating because they matched her harmonic frequency the wind matched her harmonic frequency and within 20 minutes this bridge came apart so vibration is so powerful and it can heal and it can harm yes so yes. what they found is lower strength vibrational frequencies or electromagnetic fields emfs heal the body and higher electromagnetic frequencies harm the body and there's just, you know, chapters in the book on that and various different things. But getting back to crystals. So, sorry. No, <laughs> so this is awesome. Information in my brain, you know. Um, so crystals. The thing about a crystal is that phonons, by the way, not photons, but phonons, are what enabled me to prove my theory correct that a crystal sitting on your table will have a definitive um emanation okay and that it can be excited and made stronger by anything that excites molecules which is heat light sound those things all and our attention you know because our attention is powerful our gaze is powerful we learn in feng shui from the chinese who are incredibly adept as a people in 
identifying energy and seeing it and seeing its effect because 5,000 years ago, they were able to map out the acupuncture points in your body and the meridians, which Russian scientists in like 97 have finally been able to image. And they're exactly where the Chinese said they would be. They were, but these tubes carry not just cells that can aggregate into stem cells, but they carry DNA. And are you ready for this? They carry light light and if those tubes are kinked the light still gets transmitted it's in the form of bio photons but they've been able to put a light in one uh point and see it come out the other point and it doesn't ran run randomly through your body it goes through these channels so it's like everything is being confirmed everything and you really need to see this and put it together yourself or with the help of your book of course yeah well that's <laughs> yeah my book will help because trust me you don't want to do the eight years of research that i did you don't it, it's crazy it's you did you've you've covered so much all these different and and so okay so when i was going through the titles of each of your chapters there was one chapter that popped out at me that I said to myself, this is a tinfoil hat title. Like, <laughs> I'm going to be talking to someone like, what is this? Right. And I remember in our little pre-talk, I said, I got to know because I might have to cancel this live. What <laughs> is this? What is this chapter on the flat earth? Because legit, I was like, don't tell me this bitch believes in the flat earth i'm gonna be like what am i gonna tell my viewers like this is gonna be a very difficult thing to explain <laughs> but i loved your explanation of it because you talked about paradigms and again it's it's going from that macrocosm to the down to microcosm and this idea of the experience of paradigms so can you kind of just talk a little bit about <laughs> Because yeah. I, if, if I recommend this book and someone sees Flat Earth in one of the chapters, I don't want to get yelled at. So, <laughs> well, no, it's not Flat Earth. It says, hi, I'm here to tell you that the Earth is flat. Oops, wrong paradigm. Because <laughs> I'm referring to the time of Christopher Columbus when they were afraid to sail very far because they were convinced they'd fall off the earth. And everyone believed this. How hard was it to change? You know, even when he sailed around the world, people didn't believe, mm -hmm. you know? So, and you find it again with Galileo because Galileo, he didn't come up with the theory that the, sun the earth revolves around the sun but he worked with the first um telescopes and was able to prove it to absolutely prove it immediately the church burned his papers and hoped that that public display would cause people to be afraid to pay attention to it but it didn't work and so then they banned his papers and when that didn't put this whisper out they imprisoned him to life at his home for suspected heresy because for the church because they needed you know look god is a wonderful thing if that's what you want to believe in and if that brings you, you know, for me, what we feel is so important to nourishing ourselves, to honoring ourselves. And again, forming this connection with ourselves, where we see ourselves, our bodies as being wise. Because like, do you tell a cut how to heal? You haven't got a freaking clue. Well, guess what? Your doctor probably doesn't even really know how it happens either. <laughs> right? But your cells do. Yeah. But we're going to call them stupid. That makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> I, 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 hello. You know, 
there's just so much shit out there that yeah. it boggles the mind and how we have come to be brainwashed. So we just accept these facts that don't make any sense if we actually looked at them, but we're not looking at them. Yeah. Because we've been taught not to. So anyway, the, the flat earth, the paradigm, you know, it's basically that paradigms can be very comforting to us because if i believe the same thing that you believe you might seem like a good person right it also helps us feel good because it makes us feel like the corners of our world are nicely tacked down which you know i for one i really like things being tacked down neatly that that does it for me um <laughs> but you know so much for pipe dreams but anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I didn't, I know I'm jumping around, but I didn't answer your question about the colors of crystals, which, you know, if there's a lot was my point, you know, that there's, uh, but let's look at it this way. Color is vibrational frequency. Each right. color has a specific vibrational frequency we've already mentioned that frequency heals mm -hmm. low frequency and colors have a low frequency but if you think about this too you know if we're out here saying well the color of anything doesn't matter in terms of its vibrational frequency the truth of the matter is that our bodies went through a tremendous amount of um bother to create the rods and cones in our eyes that enable us to differentiate between a very small bandwidth and yeah the light frequency and what's very fascinating small. is we put all this time and attention into developing the ability to view the only part of the light spectrum that can't kill us Woo! Where's the sense in that? <laughs> and yet we have learned that there is brilliant sense in all of creation. So that must mean there's a reason for this. It's not because all blueberries are poisonous. And it's not because all red berries are good to eat no 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 the color has frequency and maybe we need to be able to identify the colors to work with them as medicine just the way we're able to identify different foods as what we need right now so that's one aspect of the color of crystals it does matter and it does affect their energy however There's this whole thing I talk about in the somatic chapter, and you might be thinking, well, what does somatic have to do with <laughs> Great, girl and color? And <laughs> but the, yeah, the point is, is that scientists, psychologists have recently agreed that trauma is not just stored in the brain, it's stored somatically, meaning of, of the cell, in the cell, in our bodies, okay? But I looked at that from the perspective of an intuitive and from the perspective of a clairvoyant and an empath. And I said, well, of course it is. Shamans have known that forever. But what they're not looking at is that positive memories are also stored somatically within our bodies. Basically, any vibrational frequency that we have known, and I'm talking about the biblical knowing now, like you've been in bed with it, you know it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> any energy that you have known you can connect to instantly because the signature, the vibrational frequency of it is now carried in you. One of my teachers who I adore, Lupo, she teaches in um, 
Connecticut. She's got uh, Twin Star Herbal. If you can take a class with her, I recommend any class. She is amazing. But one of the things that she says is that once you've known a plant or a flower, you then carry its medicine that you can then disseminate. And again, when she says no, she means it the same way I do, that you have to open you have to connect with your instrument and read, allow these vibrations in and taste them. Become aware of them sensorily. They have a sensation because that's how these parts of our body speak to ourselves, not our third eye. Our third eye is really like a doorway that we go out. It doesn't really have to do with senses in the body. Like, I think we connect third eye wise, even when we have no body, but we can't do this sense thing when we don't have a body. That is what we're here for. We're embodied just the way those neurons were embodied in the material that carried vibrational frequency accurately. Our spirits are embodied in bodies that feel all kinds of vibrations and all kinds of sensations. And we're not here to deny them. We're here to master ourselves and to feel everything because to be the instrument, you are unique. Each individual has been hammered and dealt with, you know, I like, I, I was a fine jeweler for a long time and I've made vases and cups out of metal and you start with a sheet of metal and you hammer the fuck out of it right until it that sucker's about to crack because the more you hammer something the harder it becomes it becomes mm. brittle when you hammer it a lot and then what you have to do to continue working on your vessel is you have to anneal it. So you have to bring it up in temperature almost to the point where it lets go of its shape entirely and liquefies, mm. which mm. would be that transformation, right? But mm. we don't want to do that. We don't want to change the form that completely, but we need to relax it to that point. So you, you, you know, whoever's doing the annealing almost has to be a master to know, to bring it to that point and not take it all the way there. But once you anneal it, you can rehammer it and continue refining the shape. So each of us have been hammered and hammered and hammered by life. Okay. We each are a vessel that's a different shape that holds a different frequency. And if you wanna look at that as a sound, we are each an exquisite part of the whole symphony, but we need to play our song uninhibited, un, un held down, you know? You know, kind of like, like you were saying with the enameling, um, you know, you're allowing the warmth or the heat of the senses that you, the gifts that you've been given for the world to reshape you in a way, to allow you to soften and open in a way. Um, and that's beautiful. That is beautiful. And when you speak of the senses and you speak of the gifts of the body, you know, you're, you're talking about it from this perspective of there's a world to be observed. There's yourself to be observed there are the living creatures to be observed there are the inner parts of you that are to be observed and all of it is is through this sort of window the, through this like lens of divine something you know so it's like god or whatever you want to call it creator whatever embodies you and gives you these gifts of the senses that can be found in the gut, in the throat, in the taste, in the eyes, everywhere. So that you can experience this world and play your part in it, in this symphony that you talk about. And that's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's about mastering that and just letting that be. And then paving the way for others to do the same, you know, facilitating that environment and keeping it going. The song is not supposed to stop. 
you know, it just sounds different throughout time because all of us are so different. Um, and, and once you leave this body, you still are part of that harmonic frequency. Yeah. You know, of that greater song. Yeah. But now your your vibration has been altered by your time in the body. And I believe, you know, if you want to look at reincarnation, which I think, you know, if you, you look at what we said about the first law of thermodynamics, that it kind of supports the theory of reincarnation, at least for me, it does. And, you know, if it doesn't for you guys, that's fine. I mean, again, we each have our own lenses to view this through and each of our perspectives can enrich each other. You know, again, I think this whole idea of there needing to be one way, there isn't, there isn't for anything. Even Western medicine so desperately wants there to be one cure, one pill, one way, and everybody is different. You may be able to take doxycycline. I can't, right. I'm allergic to it, it'll kill me. You know, uh, this is the type of thing I mean. Each body is different. So if you're not going to take the time to know your body, to find out its wisdom, who is? For those of you who want to get this book, I'm going to show it right now. Here it is. Connecting the Dots, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Science by Leah Russ. This can be found on Amazon. It can also be found on Goodreads, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and also, there's going to be a hardcover uh, available through um, Ingram Spark and all of their places they distribute. And uh, you could also order them through my website. Um, and if you want to order it through my website, then I would be able to sign it for you, the hard copy. Um, but it's going to take some time because there was a problem with that edition and we had to upload a new file and I'm waiting for the proofs of that. So the hard covers won't be available immediately, but the soft covers are. And awesome. there'll also be a coil bound available on... Um, Lulu and the coil is great for people that want to teach from this. They're great for students because they lay flat. You know, you don't have to fight with the binding and break the binding and all of that. The other thing I wanted to say, if I may, is that I would really love for people to start book groups to talk about this. Yes. And to support that, if you get, you know, like a group of people together I would be willing to um, come either virtually to one session to talk about the book with you, or if it's a local group, I could actually come in person. So oh my gosh. Contact me on my website about that. That is amazing. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because it's true. Your, your book covers so many fun, different topics that it, it really is a book group's dream. Like, <laughs> it, 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 this is something that I can see people debating over. I can see people having long conversations over. I can see wine and charcuterie boards and fireplaces. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And this book being front and center. Um, so I'm just, I'm number one, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you that you finally did it. I, you, uh, you were waiting so long. You were working so hard. I'm so proud of you. Thank and you. Second, I'm, I'm so honored to, num to number two, be your friend and be able to have you on the show to talk about this and, and just kind of share that joy with you for a few moments, you know, for an hour. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming oh on today. Oh, it's what's your pleasure. website? Tell the people what's your website. How can they contact you? www.connectingthedots.guru. Don't put .com because that's some old folks thing. <laughs> <laughs> I had the choice dot between dot .guru? Dot .guru. I had the choice between dot .guru and dot .biz. And dot <laughs> .guru definitely felt like a better vibe, a better fit. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So and make you sure can you guys also, order your book. You can also check out the 
a page for the book on Facebook, which is Connecting the Dots book on Facebook. Right. Leah, once again, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to getting mine in the mail so I can then call you back up and be like, oh my God. <laughs> We'll start a book group or we can have another discussion then. For sure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. I want to say a big thank you to Steven and Madeline and all the others who have joined us tonight live and for those who will be joining us later on for the replay. Thank you guys so much for stopping by the channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, comment. And as always, this is how we grow. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>